get started. Uh, my name is Mark Chandler, and uh, some of you know me and have known me for a long time. I've been, I did my PhD uh, jointly between GIS and Lamont Doherty from 87 to 1992, and I still from a GIST perspective, I'm in the same office that I was in as when I was a graduate student. So uh, some of you, again, as I say, have known me for a long time. I spend about 75% of my time now in Wisconsin. It's a dual career family thing. My wife has a position out of Wisconsin. And uh, for a significant amount, and I've been doing that since 1994. So, um, so for carbon, Mark. 18 years. Oh, you know what? When I'm in Wisconsin, I, I either bike to uh, uh, University of Wisconsin or I work out of my home, so no, almost no carbon footprint. When I'm here, I have a 10 block walk to work, so almost no carbon footprint. So, and, and I travel um, about once every, uh, well, what used to be half time here, half time there, as now since kids have come along, I have two little kids, and so I try to spend you know, um, a little more of my time there than I do on the road. Um, but uh, uh, I, I did my PhD um, on pre-quaternary climates, and very pre-quaternary. I worked on climates of the uh, Jurassic period, which is roughly 200 million years ago, and essentially back in the late 1980s, the, the, there were not a whole lot of people here at guess who really uh, you know, had any great appreciation for the, the uh, climate of the Jurassic. Um, but um, after my PhD, I actually moved all the way up to uh, a time period about three million years ago and have spent a lot of my uh, career, at least in terms of my paleoclimate, uh, working on a time period called the Pliocene, uh, mostly with a group down at the US Geological Survey who has been focused on this time period as well. And um, because of some re recent uh, things that have occurred within the, the climate modeling community in terms of a, a resurgence of interest in this time period for AR5. Um, I thought it might be a good time to just mention uh, some things about this, uh, uh, an, an upcoming project, a model and a comparison project that's just getting underway in which we are now using um, you know, the Model E CMIP5 version to actually look at this time period. And so really have upgraded our own uh, um, ability to look at the Pliocene with our most recent versions of our GCMs. Whether that's good or bad, you you know you can judge for yourself as we go through the talk. Mark, you're, you're your uh, co-author or co-collaborator, Shukla, is she related to uh, So, Linda? No. So, no, oh, oh, she's not. Oh, she's, not. Yeah. she's not, and actually I should, I'll need to change the slide because uh, for many of you probably know Sonali, she's a graduate student of mine and she um, she just uh, defended um, last time I was in town, uh, so about three weeks ago, and immediately afterwards uh, got married. So I think she had met him before that. So her last name is now so her last name is now McDermott for uh, for any of you who saw seeing Sonali McDermott around here. And she's got a, she's already got a, a NASA postdoc lined up, and so she's going to be staying in the building. It's something about getting stuck in this in this place. There's no doubt, doubt about it. So. Um, Linda Sol, a uh, collaborator of mine, sitting right here, and Jeff Jonas, somewhere back there. Many of you know, again, probably you know these faces almost better than you know mine because they're here 100% of the time. So, um, you know, um, so why, first of all, just talk about why, why the Pliocene. It's the most recent globally warm period, so, and globally warm defined here as temperatures at or above levels of the next 50 years. I used to say temperatures that are above levels of, of the next 100 years, like but this was 20 years ago when I started talking about this. Nowadays, uh, the, the planet actually seems to be heating up faster than we thought 20 years ago. And so now we're talking about the Pliocene globally average temperature being something like the year 2050 if we stay on pace and if, and if current projections are, are, are correct. You know, um, sorry to interrupt, but that statement is made by many people and it's not true. Okay, well, you, you, you wait until the next slide and then we, you can tell me about that, okay? You'll see what my point is. So it's a datable and correlatable um, uh, time period geographically, at least this particular uh, time slab that we're looking at in the Pliocene. Continent and ocean distributions are similar to modern, which is, which is important. Um, the available global multi-proxy data sets, this USGS group um, has been working on this for 20 years. Um, collect, it spends basically all of their time in the marine realm mostly collecting uh, and analyzing uh, uh, 
data from this particular time slab, and new uh, commitments from several modeling groups to collaborate on simulations for as part of the R5. Um, so now we can talk about that. So it's always a good idea to you know steal an image from your boss um, to start your talks. Um, so, um, and and this. This uh, Pliocene temperatures, which are really benthic, um, from benthic forams, bottom water temperatures um, throughout the last uh, 60 million years or so, and the thing to focus in on is the middle section here, the, whole, the last five million years, and specifically this particular chunk of the Pliocene here. It's so uh, about, about the uh, time period from about 3 million to 3 million 300,000 years ago is the time we're looking at, and specifically um, the, the, the peaks that are within this time period. One of the things that, I'm not gonna go into a big discussion about how they actually deal with the proxy data here, but, but we are dealing with a time slab here, not a slice. So they can't particularly correlate from marine core to marine core um, by from one peak to the next like you would with the last glacial maximum. So what they do is they actually take a, a period that they can correlate amongst cores, and they can correlate amongst the cores uh, at that particular time slab because of the uh, magnetic polarity reversal that occurs in here, which they can see in all the cores. So they can easily correlate from core to core based on that polarity reversal. But there are a, a number of ups and downs within the, uh, within the uh, Delo 18 signal. Uh, in that time period, and what the USGS is doing for this Pliocene warm period is actually analyzing and the uh, forams and benthic and benthics from all of these peaks within that time period, and calling that sort of the average warming of this particular time slab. So, as I refer to the the Pliocene warm period, that's what it is, and they call it they call this a peak averaging technique. They can't actually go from core to core and say this peak is exactly the same peak in, as in some other core because of the, the, there's not fading at that resolution. So now you want yeah. So my my quarrel is only with, with this subset of what you said, namely that the world is warming faster than people oh. thought. Oh, okay. It's actually warming less, a little bit less than two tenths of a degree per decade. And even you know in the last decade, people are arguing, oh, it hasn't been warming much. trying to make there, and I'll, I'll, I'll just be more specific, was in looking at the earliest sort of results that are out based on, what are the new IC, IPCC, the RCP 8.5, RPC 6.5, these experiments that are being run with these different scenarios for, uh, for AR5. If you look at the, the scenarios that we are tracking currently, if we don't do anything to mitigate the problem, and if you believe, you know, what what's coming out of the, uh, the simulations for the newest crop of uh, GCMs, you would see that the, this temperature level, so we're talking about a, a, a temperature between two and three degrees warming, is actually reached in these experiments around the year 2050, as opposed to, <coughs> yeah, yeah, so that's what, what has changed is that the concept of how warm it was in these earlier warm periods <coughs> including the interglacials, the last, the, the few interglacials that were warmer than the, than the Holocene, and in the Pliocene, has changed dramatically. At least if you, if, if you accept our interpretation of that data, because it shows that the deep ocean was less than a degree, probably less, no more than half a degree warmer during the warmest interglacials compared to the Holocene. And even this Pliocene was not much warmer. And so, and I'm not getting argued, and, and if you read the papers, there are many of them that start right out saying, oh, this interglacial was two to three degrees warmer. Well, they're talking, that concept came from the fact that the ice cores on Antarctica and Greenland show that those periods were a few degrees warmer. But that's not a global mean temperature, and there are reasons to believe that the amplification is particularly large when you go to somewhat warmer climates than the Holocene. And it, it is true that the relationship between the deep ocean temperature and the global average, average surface temperature is not, not necessarily simple. However, and, and because 
because the deep ocean temperature depends upon the temperature of the high latitude oceans where deep water forms. And you can argue that that place where it forms might change as a function of the climate. But the relevant place for deep water formation for benthic temperatures is the Antarctic deep water. And that's already forming about as close to Antarctica as it would in warmer climates. So it's, it's probably true that even that period was not much more than a degree Celsius warmer. Your paper shows that it's a degree warmer than peak Holocene. <coughs> yeah, that's that's but, different. But we're than already back to peak Holocene. Uh, you can yes. tell that. You can right. tell that not only, but look at the stability of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Sea level is now going up at a rate of three meters per millennium. While in the last ten thousand years, in the last six or seven thousand years, it was basically stable within a meter. So, so to, we know to, that. Hold it to clarify your point here, however, because I'm not, I, I'm not sure I'm entirely getting it. Is, is your point that that things are more sensitive than we yes, believe yeah. based so, on so this? Basically, I'm supporting what you're saying, but I'm saying that, that, yeah, that it's because our concept of how warm, rather than the fact that the Earth is warming faster than we thought, it's because those prior warm periods were really only slightly warmer. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll move, move into a couple of, uh, of maps here to sort of I think get at a very important point that Jim's making here that I guess we agree on. I just couldn't tell. <laughs> um, again, the, in, in the context of, of you know what the Pliocene is and arguing for this as a time period, really, you can't. I really hate to drag out the word anal analogy for anything here, but there there is a big argument about using the pre-quaternary at all there's many many very, you know actually let me back up a second and say if you look back throughout um history so this time period here is you know right in here um if you look back throughout the cenozoic obviously we're dealing with a uh, a geologic era that is much much warmer than either the pliocene or than what we expect over the next century <laughs> we hope. <laughs> um, however, the argument against using these uh, has always been that um, once you once you uh, get a much older than about three and a half million years ago, you're dealing primarily. The biggest problem is you're dealing with continental distributions that are different enough that you might have major reorganizations of components of the climate system. And so, well, I don't, again, I'm sort of a pre-quaternary guy, and I, I believe heavily in the value of uh, the, the pre-quaternary as, as far as uh, examining warm climates, but that has been a, a really difficult argument to get past with, with much of the paleoclimate community, alone the climate community. So focusing on this time period has, has certain advantages, and, um, now, just say the Mark, since, since we took so much time at it, so is it because of the deep water formation that Jim, because that goes to different places? Is that the. Let's just move on. All right. I'll, get, I'll get to that because then I can, okay. we can talk about it in the context of what we're seeing okay. now. Um, so the, the fact that the land, sea mask, and the topography um, are basically uh, the same, but not exactly the same. So uh, one of the things is that there are a very clear indications of uh, a an approximately 25 meter sea level rise at this time period. So um, uh, although that, although you have a continental reconstruction that's essentially you know, the same, by the way, this is actually the, the, the new reconstructions for the model in our comparison were done by Linda here at GIS. So uh, these things are distributed by the DS Geological Survey, but, uh, but some of this you know, work, a significant portion of this work is actually being done at GIS still, has, has been for 20 years. But this is one of the real keys. The Isthmus of Panama is, is almost certainly in place by the time, the, by this time slab, uh, the time period. And so one of the really critical things in terms of you know, developing modern ocean circulation is the actual existence of this isthmus um, in terms of uh, mixing between the Atlantic and the, and the Pacific. And so, uh, if you, really, we don't know exactly the formation time of this, but it's pretty clear, like when you get back to the early Pliocene, so four to five million years ago, that it's not in place. So uh, you have this large argument about using anything 
um, in the pre-quaternary prior to four or five million years ago, then you have to get into this discussion of, well, but the ocean circulation may not have worked the same as it does today. So, so that's kind of a key to this time period. But you'll see things like, uh, you know, missing, missing Florida, uh, some significant differences um, in Antarctica. And um, actually, the reconstructions have to do things like uh, remove things like Hudson Bay, because that's essentially a feature from the uh, last uh, glacial period. It's a Pleistocene feature that clearly was not there in the Pliocene. So there are some differences. But again, the basic continental um, ocean um, structure is the same. Um, the other thing, then, is the ice sheets. Um, um, the ice sheets actually Obviously, you're getting your 25 meters of sea level rise from some place. You're getting it um, uh, from the uh, the reduction in the in the ice sheets. These reconstructions now it, it's very difficult when you're dealing with the it's difficult enough for the last glacial maximum, but for the Pliocene, it, 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 it's nearly impossible to do any first order reconstructions of the ice sheets. So the reconstructions that are used in the experiments are based on uh, you know, offline ice sheet modeling. The, the stuff that we've used is from the So British Antarctic Survey has uh, offline ice sheet models. And we've used various uh, experiments from Hadley Center models, from GIS models, from NCAR models to actually um, uh, run the offline uh, ice sheet models and to try to arrive at something that we believe both matches the 25 meter sea level rise but gives us a distribution we can use as boundary conditions in the models. So a big reduction in Greenland um, and West Antarctic ice sheet missing. Yeah, we keep coming back to the fact that the, the mid Pliocene sea levels were about 25 meters higher than present. What were they prior to the mid Pliocene? Well, again, if, if you think back to, I won't back up, but if you, if you accept the fact that a lot of these ups and downs in the Delo 18 signal are temperature change, mm -hmm. um, and we also know from the, um, there's a, a sediment drilling experiment that's been going on off of uh, Antarctica off of Antarctica called the Andro Project, which has very clearly um, um, shown that the West Antarctic ice sheet has come and gone throughout, really throughout the entire time period that, that the Antarctic ice sheet has been there. And that only amounts so, to about three meters of sea level rise. So, but, but, it, but, you know, what we're concerned about, and what Jim's saying, I think here before, is that the, the sensitivity of the system is quite large. I mean, if some of the things that we care the most about, right, are how sensitive are the ice sheets, particularly West Antarctica, and uh, both observa observationally um, from the Andro project, as well as uh, what, what we see in a lot of a lot a lot of the evidence for 25 meters of sea level rise comes from things like stranded beaches that they find they find on almost every continent. Um, so they're, they're, that 25 meters is not completely agreed upon as a number, but the numbers range from like 15 meters to some of the estimates are up to 60 or 70. Now, n you know, mostly people do not accept those high end numbers, but, but 25 meters of sea level rise um, is sort of the agreed upon value based on a lot of lines of evidence, al almost all geologic, but it's bolstered by the fact that we now have, uh, you know, uh, sedimentary evidence from cores that the West Antarctic ice sheet does seem to come and go on a regular basis. Yeah, I, I'm not disputing that number. What I'm trying to get at is how much, what, where was sea level prior to that? I mean, if it was much higher than present, even way before the Pliocene, because well, we're going into this very long-term cooling I trend. Back to this, but you know, this gradual buildup of this, ice. See these little these little uh, bars on this top diagram here indicate when the ice sheets actually uh, first formed. Mm -hmm. So the Antarctic ice sheet it first formed all the way back between 30 and 40 million years ago. Uh, Northern Hemisphere ice sheets much later. Um, so some ice on Antarctica has been around for a long time, mm -hmm. and but obviously there's a certain you know growth to this as well as there's a lot of ups and downs, and if the and if and if the ice sheets are as sensitive as we now are beginning to believe they are, there's been, so your question about, well, what was sea level before? Well, you know, back in the Cretaceous, there's pretty good evidence that it was. We don't, we don't need to go to the Cretaceous. I'm just saying maybe uh, two and a half, or, you know, I mean, uh, three and a half million years ago or four 
four million. I think there you're just dealing with fluctuations on the order of of what Greenland and West Antarctica can provide some maybe reductions in East Antarctica, but not dramatic. And as I said, the highest estimates you'll see based on stranded beach lines run 60, 70 meters, and then you're talking about, well, evidence from one you know, geologic site somewhere on one continent, whereas you have a, a, a lot of, in the US here, um, there's a stranded beach uh, complex along the uh, 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 Atlantic seaboard that mm -hmm. really shows up a lot uh, down in the Carolinas and is well studied. And that's where some of these, these numbers of 25 to 35 meters, some of that beach complex sort of says 25, 35 meters of sea level rise. But again, it, there, there's just a lot of evidence coming in that it's, that it's 15 meters or greater, but can you really say like, well, how, was it, how much was it fluctuating when you have that big of a range of estimates from the geologic data? Not really, and the sediment, the sedimentary data that's coming out of the Andro project doesn't really give you anything about a sea level rise. It's just telling you about the actual physical existence or lack of existence of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, again, again, and many times I have to say that many times I think we get into these discussions. Um, even within the paleoclimate community, about sort of where we're so interested, as, as we often are as scientists, in nitpicking all the little details of, of exactly what might have happened at a given time period, that the gross message of paleoclimate is just so extreme that, that with fairly small changes in temperature, we see very large changes in the Earth's uh, Climate, the, the components of the Earth's climate system that we, we really care about, such as the sea level rise and, and the existence or non-existence of m large portions of the ice sheets. And somehow that seems to get glossed over so much because we're so intent on the details, um, which again, we should be a scientist, but we, we have this extra message that we're trying to get out here about communicating just how serious the problem we might be facing is. And then, and then to raise the next question, which somebody might bring up is, is well, but how long does that take? So, you know, how long does it take the West Antarctic ice sheet to collapse? If it, even if it is sensitive to just a two to three degree warming, um, uh, and that that could cause collapse, how long do, how long would it take to collapse? Um, and those are questions that we really, you know, don't know the answer to right now. So. Somewhere. Um, Oh, and, and, and I should have said, I don't have an image of it here, but that, that vegetation has also been, um, has also, origi original Pliocene experiments, we actually just created hand-drawn maps of vegetation based on terrestrial site analysis of terrestrial sites, fossils, um, uh, plant fossils and pollen um, from terrestrial sites. But in the new, um, in the new order of things, uh, they're actually using Biome 4, um, so a biome model to reconstruct the Pliocene uh, vegetation and then it is checked against the actual data sites for, um, for where, where we have data in terrestrial environment for plants and then that, that bi the biome 4 results are then tweaked to give what we use as a bonded condition for the Pliocene. Um, so, but just to give you a, a quick idea of what the USGS has in their pocket in terms of a, of a marine distribution. Um, so these are cores where, where, where they have this particular time slab and, um, in the core and where it's been well analyzed and multi-proxies. So it's not just, not just one proxy, but usually three, four, five different proxies for, the, uh, for uh, each of these cores. Um, and I don't believe that there's a data set of the, you know, you can certainly, you know, see the huge gaps as there are in many of these paleoclimate uh, time periods. But I don't believe that there is a time period other than the last glacial maximum that for which we have such an extensive global uh, analysis of, of, the, of the data from the time period. So as modelers, it gives us a, a, a really good one. It, this is the way that um, the sea surface temperature boundary conditions are created if you're just running atmosphere only experiments of the Pliocene. Um, if you're running coupled model experiments, it gives you something to check against. You have a very large proxy data set to check against, which again, you'll see. Uh, I also wanted to point out that part of the reason um, that there's been a real resurgence in the interest in the Pliocene was in AR4, uh, David Rind, who again, many of you know, was uh, one of the lead authors on a new chapter that AR4 had called Paleoclimate. 
was the first time there was a Paleo Climate chapter in one of the IPCC documents. And, um, and he argued for pre-quaternary being included within the, uh, within the Paleo Climate chapter. He was the only person in the room of the lead authors who wanted pre-quaternary in there. And he uh, kind of came back to Giss and said, okay, we've got our chance. Um, they will do a sidebar on, on pre-quaternary, but only if you know, we write up something good that they accept. So let's sit down and write something. And I called Jim Zakos up and said, you know, let's not just do it on Pliocene. Let's pull out some stuff from other interesting time periods like the Eocene. And, and Jim and I uh, wrote up um, what was just a, a sidebar and sent it back whenever the next meeting of the lead authors was. And they liked it so much, they said, well, let's expand this a little more. We'll give you a figure also. Well, yeah. through the whole process, and believe me, any, uh, many of you involved in the IPCC process, um, you know, people fight over paragraphs, I mean, to, to get into these chapters. I mean, it's really a, quite a process. In the end, we garnered four pages of the, uh, uh, for the pre-quaternary um, in the paleoclimate chapter. So, and, and about, you know, half of that's Pliocene. And that really, I mean, the USGS really took note then. So the, this, this little group, the PRISM group that does the Pliocene at USGS is sort of like, you know, they're in a basement room somewhere, you know, that USGS wasn't paying attention to. And when the document came out, and obviously all the attention that the document got, and then to see that, that there was such a major um, component of it um, on the Pliocene, it really, the USGS started putting a lot more money back into the Pliocene project. And, and we held a, a workshop here at GIS about three years ago. So, you know, a year after, a year or two after um, IR4 came out. And, um, and really um, partially funded by Jim, partially funded by USGS, pulled together a bunch of people from all the different modeling groups and said, you know, um, we've been kind of doing this on our own, GIS, GIS, and, GIS and USGS. How about if we start getting a lot of the other modeling groups to pay attention to this time period and manage to get a lot of a lot of interest? So there's now the, the new uh, PlyoMIP, you know, um, intercomparison project, um, which is a subset of the larger PMIP. Um, inter many there are many time periods that are being intercompared uh, with the models. Has now garnered uh, um, interest from a, a, a significant um, you know subset of the uh, of the CMIP five models. So, and we just had our sort of, uh, I guess the GIST meeting a few years ago was the kickoff meeting in the sense that, well, we had to convince everybody to do this, and then people had to go back and fight for funding to be able to actually run their experiments um, with these rather expensive models to run. Um, but in August, we got back together for the first time um, and actually started looking at, uh, you know, each other's experiments and how far, you know, how far along is everybody. It turns out GIST is, farther along than any of the other groups, but they have all made substantial um, efforts at modeling this time period. So on to the experiment details. Just so just quickly, uh, so we are using the GIST Model E and it is the CMIP 5 version. Um, and uh, that version, for those of you who don't know, is an atmosphere of two by two and a half degrees um, um, latitude longitude, 40 layers in the atmosphere, and then an ocean of one by 1.25 on um, 32 layers. And believe me, setting up that model for a paleoclimate time period where you have to change anything with regards to the continental configurations is a very daunting task that requires a lot of skills. And I don't think this is a key issue with regards to doing these kinds of experiments at any of the modeling groups, unless you're kind of in tight with one of these modeling groups, I think actually transforming one of these GCMs to do these experiments is almost impossible. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, even after many years of working with a model, I can't imagine doing this on my own if, if I didn't have access to, the, you know, Gavin and Igor and Rado and Jeff, and et cetera, all the people who can really help you get these things set up. Um, so the, again, that's the, the fact that the other groups have actually managed to do that as well, and are running these experiments is a pretty, is a pretty uh, significant um, um, uh, occurrence, I think. So the control run is the CMIP-5 pre-industrial. We're not running that, so uh, Larissa is running that for us, and we just uh, crib off of that and off of Gary's website. Um, and, then, and then our experiments use the Pliocene boundary conditions from the USGS's PRISM-3 project, the stuff that we've done and the stuff that Bass has contributed as well to, to the boundary conditions. And all the groups are using the exact same boundary conditions. Oh, and I should say that we also decided on a CO2 level of 405 ppm um, for, uh, 
for and with all the other greenhouse gases is still pre-industrial. So the only the only difference is an increase in C uh, CO2 up to 405 ppm. And there are estimates of CO2 for this time period as well. Um, they all, for years and years and years, multi-proxy estimates of CO2 for this time period keep coming back that there's not much increase in CO2, at least not beyond what we have today in the atmosphere. So it's, a, it's, it's above uh, pre-industrial levels. Um, but it's, the Pliocene is not like one of these, oh, four times CO2 time periods. And that, that is again and again and again, studies have found that. Yeah? Isn't there data on methane from cores that you can use? Um, the, the methane is from ice cores. So this yeah. time period is, the, the ice cores don't extend back this oh, okay. far. But there, there are, there are, there are potential proxies. And as a matter of fact, to some extent, you can get it's not entirely clear with all in all the studies that some of what you're measuring might be methane, <laughs> actually. So this might be an equivalent okay. as much okay. as it is yeah. anything else. But that's the way it's discussed. And we have chosen the high end in this group, this multi-model inner comparison group, has chosen the high end of the estimates. So this would be like, they usually fall around three, uh, 380 ppm, plus or minus 25 is where these estimates fall. And so we've chosen the high end of the of CO two increase for these experiments. There's been you know there's been a fair amount of arguing about some of these things. I'm not going to go um, into um, all, all the details of the sea surface temperatures. But then to show you, so um, annually average the sea surface temperatures that came from all those core sites that I told you um, look something like this. And the one difference, if, if you ever see this map produced by them, you won't. It, will, it doesn't look quite the same if you, if you look at the details. And that's because what I've done here is to show you the anomaly between, the, um, between their data set and our control run. So this is our pre-industrial control run. And what you see, quite significantly, picking out the, warm, the, the, the great warming in the North Atlantic, this is, again, very consistent amongst all Pliocene warming data sets, this, just, this large warming in the North Atlantic and warming in the Pacific, too. Um, and uh, generally, generally what their data shows is, is not much change in temperature in the tropics. Again, these are really kind of common, warm, pre-quaternary climate kind of looking sea surface temperature data sets where you get a lot of high latitude sensitivity and not much tropical sensitivity. It's also interesting to notice from your uh, graph that there isn't all that much warming around Antarctica either. So uh, where is all that well, ice? Well, I mean, you know, from? there is, there is, you know, so th this is eight minus eight to eight degrees here. So um, <laughs> I'll change the scale a little later on. Um, but but there is there is a you know a, there is a significant warming because and there's a reduction in sea ice, which you're going to see in a minute. So um, there's got to be s some warming, a lot more, no doubt, much more is falling in the northern hemisphere. Do you understand that maximum there in, 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 in <laughs> green and sea? Exactly. Oh, you do. So, <laughs> no, exactly. That's the question. Right, okay. <laughs> and say we do. So uh, again, just to, just a to, uh, touch on one other thing is there's been a lot of discussion then about how long we need to run these coupled model experiments um, um, to try to achieve something that looks like those sea surface temperatures that observations or proxy observations. Um, uh, originally, we thought the best we could hope for out of all these groups would be to get a 500 year simulations. Um, again, they're expensive to run. Um, um, and I have to tell you that based on just looking at the surface air temperature uh, results um, for the GIS model, and when, then this is kind of where we were at in August when I went to the meeting, I, I, you know, I said to people, 500 years doesn't appear to be long enough with the GIS GCM because we're not in equilibrium yet, even in the surface air temperature. Jeff just handed me this as he walked into the room today, mm -hmm. saying this is the latest. So the, the experiments are now out to 950 years. This, sorry, this is a horrible way to do this, but um, <laughs> but this is this this is that plot extended further out, and you notice how notice the flattening over the last 400 years. So it, it was kind of coincidence that at the at this meeting that I went to. And I, and I said to everybody, well, 500 years doesn't appear to be long enough with our model. By the way, every modeling group is coming up with different answers to that, however. Um, but it is kind of fortuitous that now that I see these that Jeff just handed me, 
that right after this time period, it, it, everything kind of nicely flattens out. And so, you know, let me just say here, like six, <laughs> 600 years roughly would be enough with our model. How about the gradient between North and Southern Hemisphere? That uh, it appears to disappear in the paper. Yeah, um, and this, <laughs> notice this. Notice, no, that doesn't, that doesn't. Can I do this? Notice this. Um, see the f how flat the global temperature signal is? Up, and that's only out of like 200, 250 years. So N the NCAR folks came into the meeting in August and showed their results. Oh, we stopped it after 200 years because everything's seen. And they showed like the global temperature line. It's like because everything seems to be stable by then. And then I popped this out and I said, well, yeah, if we had stopped ours at 200 years, we would that that's what we would have thought also. But you know, look what happens. Now I have to admit that having said that, could that something else happen again? Um, you know, here possibly, but it, you know, four or five hundred years beyond this, with everything basically stabilized, seems to be a pretty good indication that for our model, for model E, um, that 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 that's long enough. But that, again, these are substantial. Uh, believe me, for paleoclimate people, grabbing seen the five versions of the models and running five hundred year simulations is not something we get an opportunity to do a lot. Now I, I say we, I mean we as the whole global group of modelers, we're very lucky here at Gips to have quite a bit of access to supercomputing time at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, but we, you know, we're we're conservative with what we what we do because if other groups can't do it as well, you know, you know, well there, there's some utility to us doing it by ourselves, but but we're supposed to be part of a big project here now. So, so that's with the Russell Ocean? Ru yeah, right, so it's the uh, Russell Ocean. I you showed this when you walked out. It's the full two by two and a half atmosphere with a one by 1.25 um, ocean um, of Russell. So have you done a uh, instantaneous forcing of that model to see the response function? The an instantaneous forcing of double CO2. Could you know? be double CO2 or anything else. Yeah, we've talked about it. It's not, I don't know if it's running, is it? Double CO2 experiment? Um, what, what we're doing right now, again, something you missed, Jim, is that we're using uh, sort of the high end of the CO2 estimates for the Pliocene in these experiments, which is 405 ppm. Um, and so what we all agreed to do uh, all the groups agreed to do was to run another control experiment with just 405 ppm CO2. Everything else is pre-industrial. We're using Larissa's pre-industrial control run so that we're not, you know, we're not running our own control run. We just want this compared to whatever the GIST standard is. Um, I know that sort of changes from time to time too. But it would be very useful if you did this a delta, a uh, step function because that defines the response function and you can analytically you're saying with the on top of the control room, not on top yeah. of the plastic. Right. Yeah, where's Gavin? So he, he shouldn't Gavin be doing that? <laughs> <laughs> well, he should. But you know, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, be, we could do that. Yeah. It might be interesting to then use, once you have a equilibrium biosync, to do a step function there, because it might not be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, it wouldn't be the same. Because of the starting boundary conditions are different enough, particularly with respect to the ice sheets. Yeah. So, um, but Mark, we did we did start up one. Uh, I think that it was a thousand ppm. Um, we oh yeah we have a yeah. but these are, but those are all with the Pliocene. So we yeah. have we have increased CO two experiments going uh, a five uh, five fifty and at one thousand ppm doing with the same thing, but that's not on the control level. So, um, so just to, uh, again because we. Kind of behind here, I'll just quickly put up this table just to show you. So the, this first, uh, this is the, the results from the, the Mali control run. And, and by the way, these are all taken from years 771 to 800, so averages, a 30-year average from that period of this um, experiment. So as I showed you, well, well within the equilibrated uh, time frame. So the coupled control run versus the coupled Pliocene. And then just for reference, I'm putting up the atmosphere only Pliocene. So this is where you're driving it with those SSTs as a boundary condition. And, and so in a sense, you would like the coupled model, assuming that those SSTs that are coming from the SGS are correct for the Pliocene, you'd like your coupled model to reproduce this th th these results. Um, you know, uh, Control runs, you know, very much in balance. I'm surprised, but I guess I hadn't looked at it before. I'm surprised how in balance that control run is. The Pliocene gets, you know, very close. 
Um, obviously, the atmospheric only is out of uh, energy balance because of the warmer, um, uh, the, the warmer SSTs and the lack of ability to allow them to adjust to the atmosphere. The surface air temperature, you get about a 2.1 degree warming, which is not that dissimilar globally from if you believe that the benthic uh, numbers on the Delo 18 curve are representative also of a, sort of a roughly a global surface air temperature that, you know, the coupled model, and the coupled model is actually a little warmer than the uh, specified one, so it was a bit of a surprise. Small increases in precipitation, the actual global precipitation coming from the coupled run is identical to that from the uh, atmosphere only run. Now you get into the issue where we're getting into these issues though of, of fairly significant differences and that's you do get a big reduction in the Arctic uh, sea ice cover but um, you don't get as much as would be anticipated based on the uh, sea, sea ice estimates um, from, uh, from the USGS's data sets. Um, you also get a reduction in the, in the Antarctic, and, and as a matter of fact, you get more of a reduction than, than would be estimated uh, from the USGS's data sets. Um, however, planted from the planetary albedo standpoint, in case you think something is you know, crazy going, going on with the clouds here or something, you, you, you do get a reduction in the planetary albedo, obviously related to the cryospheric changes as well as vegetation plays into that. But in terms of, in terms of clouds, you, you, you're, you're seeing the couple that in the atmosphere only run. Uh, uh, getting similar values here. So kind of the big differences that really what we need to look at are in, in what's happening with the sea ice cover and obviously the distribution of sea surface temperatures. So if I remind you quickly of, this is the data set then, so this is just a, a uh, uh, an image of the data set taken from the USGS cores. Again, now I, as I told you a minute ago, I would change this, um, this um, uh, uh, color bar scale a little bit here. But again, the key elements here, difference with Model E's control run, so this is the pre-industrial control run, um, are this, gr uh, this really uh, uh, strong warming in the North Atlantic and in the Pacific, the warming around the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Southern Hemisphere. And again, this, this slight cooling to, now I should say again, in the data sets, they would claim that there's just not much change in the tropics, the temperatures of this time. If you difference with our pre-industrial control run, however, you actually see that the Pliocene temperatures are slightly cooler in the tropics. So a very odd, you know, sort of a global warming sort of uh, uh, distribution of sea surface temperatures and, you know, prepare yourself. So model E's, so the coupled models run of uh, sea surface temperature results from at a time period when the model's definitely uh, in equilibrium, seven to 800 years out. And this is model E's temperature. So I said, oh yes, we nicely get that global warming just about right for you know compared to the benthic signal, but the sea surface temperature distribution that we're getting from the model is drastically different. And we're achieving that global warming in a very different way than the, the USGS's data suggests. Your, your run is way too short. At you, you, at eight hundred years. Yeah. Because, uh, well, we'll let it keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the whole the North Atlantic thing is completely. Completely out of whack with the global, and, and it takes a couple of millennia. And uh, well, it'll be interesting. Okay, Jeff, we <laughs> just been asking how long you let these things <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, just keep going. <laughs> um, so, um, well, you, you know, the global warming that we get in the runs that I've done looks like this for this century. I'm talking about 21st century. And certainly, again, because, because we put some fresh water in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, so, like. so I'll show you that um, also in terms of like, so you begin to ask questions of, you know, and we are just beginning to ask these questions um, um, as to, so what's going on here? Well, you can see in terms of the, the salinity, this is just the surface salinity. You can see the, the uh, actual decrease in salinity um, um, in the Pliocene runs uh, throughout the, uh, the North Atlantic. Um, it, it'll be interesting. I know there's been some stuff on the message boards going around the last couple of weeks about the, the river uh, diagnostics from, from the climate model, which I have read but not completely <laughs> figured out how they relate to uh, analyzing our own stuff. But there is, there are changes, you know, that are significant at all the river mouths here in terms of uh, the the uh, amount of fresh water that's obviously going into the oceans from from the rivers. Now the rivers in the Pliocene here are basically just modern drainage systems that are extended or shortened based on the sea level change. 
but uh, so they're, so they're, they're essentially modern river systems as well, um, and um, and there are clear changes. But what what, what th that means in terms of the meridional ocean circulation is unclear. Also, if you take a look at the stream function, you can see something here in the North Atlantic. Well, what, what's happening with the Gulf Stream? Um, it's clearly um, moving southward from its position in the modern. And for those of you who haven't looked at a lot of paleoclimate experiments, that's something you would expect out of the last glacial maximum experiments, which are roughly, you know, three to five degrees colder than modern, as we see um, the actual Gulf Stream, at, you know, moving southward. So to see that, I, I that's guess. Because your run is too short. <laughs> <laughs> so. The next so anyway, the uh, large downward heat flux in the North Atlantic, we're obviously down. This may be a Russell Ocean model thing, but again, the Russell, the, the, that ocean model is kind of well known for burying heat down uh, um, deep in the ocean in, in a way that it shouldn't be doing, even in the control runs. And that downward heat flux in that region may just be taking a lot of that heat out of the surface North Atlantic and burying it down deep where, and that, again, unrealistically. This is a stream function for the barotropic ocean yeah. circulation. So, does it mean that both both gyres in the Atlantic st uh, strengthen both the cyclonic and the anticyclonic? Is that, is that well, if you call, yeah, if you call this. No, no, up there, up there, I'm looking at, at the south of Greenland, and there's a negative that means uh, oh. that it means that the gyre gets stronger, and and the other one south of there. Yes, yeah, so and whether or not that's related, you know, uh, one of the things I don't I don't have an image of here is, and Jim's talking about. Uh, the progression of what happens in the North Atlantic. We, we actually have sort of, you know, you know, multiple images looking at the progression. And to be honest with you, I wish there was a, like a nice trend occurring in the North Atlantic. There's not really, you get, you get, you know, uh, a strengthening and then a weakening and um, a reversal. And it, there isn't, in a, in a sense, a of something you would really call an obvious equilibrium with regards to the, the, um, the gyres or the meridional overturning circulation, but let me show the next plot because this is this is the last plot um, here. But but it gets to the key point of are we going to have a recovery or is there going to be a change if we run this for another thousand years? So this take a look at this plot on on your right here. Um, so the the um, the red kind of hidden underneath there um, is the North Atlantic overturn and. You know, you want something, or actually we'd like something even stronger than this to, uh, in our model. But we expect from our control run that, you know, we might get um, uh, North Atlantic deep water production in the, in the order of peaking around, you know, 14 sphere drips from this model. And it absolutely collapses, and it does not look to me like it's coming back. Um, I will say that I've seen the NCAR model results, so, um, and, um, and the um, MAROC. Um, results uh, for this as well at the meeting they had this available and both of, in both those cases their North Atlantic deep water collapses um, at the beginnings of the runs and then recovers over the course of a few hundred years I don't know enough about why those, those models are doing that but that's clearly a point of interest in the analysis of the comparisons of the models as to why some of the models seem to recover um, uh, in the North Atlantic and, and our model does not. You can also see, however, it's being, um, it's, it's uh, the overall overturning uh, may be staying somewhat the same in the Northern Hemisphere because it's ramping up in the North Pacific. And uh, um, obviously at this point, I, you know, I'd love to have discussions. I, that's why you, I guess you went to, you, last time I was in town, I actually made a point of coming and being able to attend the, <laughs> the ocean modeling meeting um, because, uh, you know, I am curious as to whether or not these types of things are model E specific issues or, you know, just how much can we use these types of experiments to analyze what's going on in the Pliocene versus using the experiments to examine uh, issues related to our model. So, um, but that's, that's sort of where we're at right now in terms of what we have. So, I know, I mean, this is sort of counterintuitive because typically argument is that the smaller basin is the one that overturns more easily. So the Pacific being the bigger one, and you see the, the blue oh. curve going up. It's mm -hmm. sort of 
I mean, just yeah, yeah. There, there's not necessarily anybody in the room who would know that about the control run, but but with regards to the the um, the experiments that are being done for AR5 with um, the CMIP5 version, I'm, I'm wondering if there if this is something that's being seen in, in those experiments, you know, as an indication that there's a problem with the well the model. You know, that's actually interesting because it's our our model has been always or at least sometimes on the verge of Pacific Ocean deep water formation. And of course the, now there are interesting indications of Pacific deep water formation with some key point mm -hmm. um, record. So it's not necessarily unphysical. And and the and it is in uh, in large part what's probably allowing the North Pacific to warm up as much as it does. Um, and so the North Pacific in these uh, experiments is looking closer to the USGS data set. It, 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 and, but it, and it may be because this is happening. The North Atlantic is the real confusing uh, component of these, of these simulations where there's a real mismatch. And I have to, let me just uh, get out of PowerPoint here a second and show you my, uh, this. Uh, that's so I just put that up as my desktop so I could show you, remind you of this. This is the GCM's uh, um, sea ice loss from AR4 experiments. And, um, you know, it was the GIS, and, and by the way, they're written here in order of sensitivity. And, you know, it's the GIS models um, from AR4 that were the least sensitive uh, in terms of Arctic sea ice loss. And uh, then to some extent, that seems to be what we're gonna see in the Pliocene experiments as well with the AR5 model. Is Are that still using the same sea ice? I mean, is the, is the current GIS model sea ice still so insensitive? Uh, so this is my first indication that, that it may be not as insensitive, but still less sensitive than most of the other models. That, that's the early indication based on. Again, I'm basing that on Pliocene experiments. If you had more sensitive sea ice in the Arctic, and presuming that that would make sea ice more realistic, then the combination of Pacific deep water formation and more sensitive sea ice may provide an explanation for why the Pliocene Arctic is so incredibly warm, and you can't seem to get it in right. the models. And how that also then relates uh, one of the things that you see in these in these experiments is that although you do get warming in the Arctic it's not warm enough to significantly reduce the ice extent re reducing ice thickness quite a bit and this was true of some of the other models as well where you see a lot of reduction in ice thickness in these experiments but somehow something about these experiments are not quite warm enough to really sort of go that next step whereas you got really thin Arctic ice it wouldn't take that much more warming to all of a sudden, you know, really reduce it a lot. But at least in our model, and again, also in some of the other models, you you are seeing this this fact that, and again, that's could be a highly parameterization dependent uh, in terms of what's how the Arctic is responding. So, so yeah, you know, the fact that the 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 way that people have tried to get out of this difficulty that the Arctic doesn't warm up the way it know what really did is to try to put in some stratospheric clouds or yeah. something which it seems to me that that's pretty yeah. far-fetched the more likely thing is that the ocean you can you just soaking up enough energy in the summer that the ocean is the thermal inertia is carrying you through the winter mm -hmm. but that requires that you get rid of the sea ice yes right and so maybe you can solve no, that well now i have to say these, our experiments, not, not these experiments, but our experiments with the Pliocene are initializing. So uh, I didn't mention that. The coupled model, obviously we're not fixing the ocean to those prism sea surface temperatures, um, but that doesn't change the fact, happy Halloween movie. Um, <laughs> um, that doesn't change the fact that you have to initialize the coupled model somehow. And we had tried experiments where you initialized using, you know, just the levitus condition that with, with some fill related to the changed uh, sea level. Um, and that's what we had to do as far as salinity goes, because there is no paleo salinity um, observations. Um, 
But then when we put in the Pliocene, the, there was another project done here 10 years ago, which uh, ourselves and uh, Duke University did in terms of actually collecting data and constructing three-dimensional temperature data sets to go with the USGS's surface temperature data sets. And um, we all, all the modeling groups are initializing with fully three-dimensional Pliocene, the best that we know, Pliocene um, ocean temperatures. And yet, the ice comes back right away. So this is, it's not just like if yeah, you, you have to get some heat transport in the ocean up mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I wonder though, <laughs> it just dawned on me, you know, we like start the experiments like January 1st. Yeah, the, your ocean <laughs> circulation, your o well yeah, your ocean <laughs> circulation is not the Pliocene ocean circulation. Right. In, March it, 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 <laughs> in ISIS, I wonder if you can't get heat in there easier Then it does require runs. You've got to do, be doing millennia. Well, we have an open bearing strait at this time period, um, you know. So there, there's the potential to actually um, have have heat movement from the North Pacific into the Arctic. Um, but again, we're just not. I don't. I, I don't think that any of these models are going to you could say are accurate enough to determine when you're so close to a situation where you have thin Arctic ice but you still have a pretty good sized cap. Um, that just just certain tweaks and various parameterizations, you could go from a lot of Arctic ice to almost no Arctic ice in these experiments, you know, very easily. It's just we don't, we have not run that many sensitivity experiments yet. We have, I said a minute ago that the salinity issue was one where we have to actually use Levitas's salinity because there is no paleo proxy for salinity. Um, but we, one of the sensitivity experiments we did was to say, well, that might in and of itself be forcing something to be more modern-like that wouldn't have actually happened in the Pliocene. And so we tried a, just a uniform salinity experiment and ran it, you know, we've run it, you know, past 500 years. That may be out, what, seven or 800 years now too. It's stunning how similar that run is to this run. So the, the, the fact that really going just to a purely uniform salinity. And when I say uniform, I don't just mean geographically. I mean at all, you know, every every level having the same salinity, a uh, you know, mean ocean salinity. Um, it, the, the, uh, the model just readjusts very quickly and just follows a certain path that's very similar. And I, we, we stopped that experiment. It was so similar through 500 years that we just stopped that experiment. It wasn't worth, you know, wasting the CPU time anymore. Now, whether or not a different salinity you know, that is more, you know, ex more extreme, you know, and that would just be a process of coming up with a sensitivity experiment in which you actually create some sort of a, a salinity distribution. Now you're saying, you know, a lot of, a lot of experiments actually have been done over the years to test the sensitivity to dumping fresh water in or dumping salt water into the uh, North Atlantic to see what happens and then, and then allowing the system to then recover to see if it does recover or does not recover. And different models actually get different results. You know, if you, if you could look at GFDL compared to NCAR, compared to GIS and those types of experiments, you get three different results as to what happens to um, overturning yeah, in no, those types of extreme the experiments. The recovery is, is, is very hard because, you know, the, the overturning is um, sort of self-sustaining and the non-overturning is self-sustaining too. You know, what you show here was the non-overturning state in the Atlantic, and that's consistent with getting a lot of freshening at the surface because you don't have the salt transport northward. And so that, that you get a lot more rain falling into the ocean, and that, that really makes it really hard to restart the overturning. If, it, if it's derived from the model itself, yeah. um, uh, if, excuse me, if it's derived from the model itself in terms of what I was saying with regards to the river changes, though, I mean, it has to be coming out of the Mediterranean because the Nile is the only one that actually seems to freshen um, the uh, the output at its source around the North Atlantic. Um, you see, so you're talking about the freshening now. The freshening, freshening yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I showed in general that um, that um, the salinity was reduced in the North Atlantic. Yeah, but uh, you could get that very easily by reducing the evaporation. Sure. Uh, and so uh, the, the evaporation. Uh, well, but you know, again reducing the evaporation in a much warmer, when you're starting with much warmer temperatures, there's obviously uh, looking at changes um, in the storm, you know, the storm systems moving across yeah. there is probably the most significant thing we need to look at with respect to why that 
North Atlantic is freshening, despite a lot of surrounding river systems seeming to have not contributed. Yeah. So this is the original trigger that you think about. I'm thinking about the, the, the mature state when it's, everything is fresh out there, then it's very hard to restart the, the overturning. So once, the you have the, once you have this, yeah. that yeah. collapsed yeah. meridional motion circulation, I mean, it, it, it probably is suggestive of the need to try something with these experiments that does go along the lines of, let's say, that, you know, let's just say we started with a salinity structure that was conducive to the overturning as opposed to be, like I said, a, a uniform salinity um, sensitivity experiment and see whether or not, if it doesn't collapse in the first place, how, how different does the experiment um, proceed? Obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's after two o'clock and I'm not gonna get to the whole thing about NGCM, which, uh, so I, that just means I get invited back to give another lunch. So I know Bastian, he's like, <laughs> oh, he's like trying to twist people's arms. So I'll just do one in the spring or something on, on the education. We, we have another, so I, I work in the Pliocene and then I have another half of my time which is spent on, on this project called EDGCM, which stands for Educational Global Climate Modeling Project. And the nice thing about that project is that that, that one, unlike the Pliocene, is actually funded by NASA. So um, it's maybe more pertinent in some ways to this giving a talk here about it. There's a big NASA program called the uh, Global Climate Change Education Program, and they've been funding lots of institutions around the United States to improve STEM education, um, and specifically with respect to um, climate change education. And a project that, that comes out of this institute in which we basically provide user-friendly versions of, of older versions of our GCM to schools and universities and other organizations, um, has been picked up by many of the people who have been funded by the GCCE program. Uh, and so we are partnering with lots of institutions, everything from historically black colleges to, to, um, to sort of the tier one research universities that are uh, several that are using at GCM, as well as uh, AMS and their education program now uses EDGCM and the American Museum of Natural History and their distance learning courses now use EDGCM as part of their courses. And uh, so a big part of what I spend my time doing also are lots of professional development training for teachers and, and students at universities, kind of focusing um, from the sort of grades nine to 16 mostly. But um, I, I, I would like to get a chance to tell everybody about that project at some point in time too, and I'll just do that in another. Who's the headquarters manager that provides funding for this? GCC, it's uh, Lynn Chambers out of Lang. She's at Langley. She's not at headquarters, and I don't know what the flow of money is. I assume it's gotta be Bingham Lang out of um, headquarters, right? I mean, I don't know. So, but but Lynn Chambers is the my NASA program manager contact, and she has run that program for this. Uh, there's been three separate announcements of opportunity. Now, the program, one of the big changes in that program, which has not made anybody real happy, but is kind of understandable in the current environment, is not necessarily a loss of money in the program, at least last year, but a redistribution such that the lead institutions on the projects all had to be minority-led institutions. And for us, in which, in, in the sense that we aren't ever really going out and saying we're a lead, because they think of us as, you know, they think of me, yeah, I'm, a, I'm sort of a Columbia University employee, but they think of me as a NASA GIS person, so I'm not really fundable, per se, as the lead institution anyhow. But that did really reduce the number of institutions that could come to us. And, and on the other hand, I have to say, we were immediately sought out by several of the new group of institutions that they're trying to fund and um, decided that we could participate on two proposals. You, know, you don't you get spread too thin. You know, the, the danger is not getting any funding versus, oh, all of a sudden you're serving 10 different groups. Um, and so we put in two proposals and one of them got funded. So, um, so we, we have had a really good track record and people in part are seeking us out because if you have one um, climate, excuse me, modeling, get the climate part. Modeling is a big focus of um, the national uh, science education standards and climate is going to be a increased focus in the new national science education standards. And the, both of those things are things that teachers really have a hard time going, well, how am I gonna teach this? I don't know any of 
about it. There's, a, there's myriads of stuff on the web that none of it's really prepared mm -hmm. in terms of curriculum, etc. And when they see, oh, and then the program is a NASA program and requires some kind of a NASA connection. And then they run, you know, just so searching on the web, they run into EdGCM project and it's at GIS and, and boom, you know, we're getting calls left and right to participate on proposals. Um, but our, we have been known now over like three separate cycles of this that a program that funds roughly seven to nine percent of the proposals they get, about a third of the proposals that we participate on get funded. And so, um, so people are kind of like looking to us to sort of help boost their chances of getting funding. And again, I, it's not anything special, um, I think, about, you know, I'm certainly not a trained education person. I've worked in science education quite a bit over the last 10 years, but I'm not a trained science education person. Um, but, but I think it's this combination of climate and modeling that we bring to these proposals that puts them really over the top with the education reviewers. And um, um, so I hope that continues. Again, <clears throat> the frustration for us is that NASA has moved the program. I should have also said, not only did they move the program into a situation where it was going to be, had to be led by a minority uh, institution, but the NASA contribution could only get 10% of the funding maximum. And so that reduced <laughs> us down. On every proposal that we work on, we can only get, you know, take a smaller chunk of the funding because again, they don't see us as Columbia University, they see us as NASA Yes. So, um, but, but I spend, I, I said in the beginning, I spent a fair amount of my time going back and forth between here and Wisconsin, though now I'm also spending a, a, a lot of my time going other places as well. I, I travel every month someplace um, to give um, professional development training workshops or to work with partners through this GCCE program. And also there are companies that develop science curriculum, um, some very famous old companies in the United States from dating to the Eisenhower administration of, uh, of um, yeah, not old in terms of paleo climate, but old in terms of science <laughs> education. Um, the golden years of science education sort of stem in, in large part from the Eisenhower years. And some of the, there, there's a whole group of companies that were developed to do science curriculum at that time frame that are still in existence and are still wow. some of the big, big groups that do, do science education curriculum. And they have also sort of come, uh, I think the three major companies that do that have all come to us. and you know, want us to help develop curriculum around climate modeling. And actually that will be our next proposal to actually, which will go to NSF, um, letters of intent due in November, are to really do a full-blown curriculum around climate modeling, not just, gee, let's do this as a little component of climate change curriculum, but actually say, here's a three-week course that you can teach on climate modeling, and you can actually have the students actually doing some real use of the models themselves and so I, anyway I, I not, not much more to say on that discussion I'll do that uh, like I said maybe next semester or sometime thanks all for coming <laughs>